Hello, my YouTube channel subscribers to Big Bill Anderson's Death Tours. I am here at 1115 Monte Vista Road in Phoenix, Arizona. And this home right here behind me on December 2nd, 1958, was where a gruesome crime was committed against a mobster, Gus Greenbaum, and his wife, Bess. They were both slain here in this house is still an unsolved murder to this day in Phoenix and uh, Gus Greenbaum was they believe skimming money from the Riviera Hotel in Las Vegas he was part of the Chicago mob and I'm going to tell you the whole story as best I can and I'm going to take you also to the grave site of Gus Greenbaum and his wife and also to another grave Right next to them, his sister-in-law was also murdered by the mob in a hit just a couple years before Gus and his wife were killed right here in this house. And actually, I'm going to take you and show you a picture of uh, Bess Greenbaum, who was murdered right behind this window, right there. And there's a fireplace right over there, and then there's this front window over here. And I'm going to show you a picture of how the mob left her. It's a bit graphic, but it wasn't so graphic that it wasn't on the New York Times and the Phoenix Papers front page of her hogtied and murdered in this very house right here. So I'm going to show you some pictures, tell you the whole story, tell you the theory about how they believe it went down that night on December 2nd, 1958. Gus Greenbaum and Mo Sedway were partners in Las Vegas, and also they took the Mo and the Green from their two combined names and made Mo Green, and that became a character for the Godfather movie with Alex Rocco playing Mo Green. Green from Greenbaum, Mo from Mo Sedway, another gangster, Chicago outfit. And it all comes back to this Phoenix house where Gus Greenbaum thought he could retire. He was 65 years old, but he was still working, going back and forth to Vegas, skimming money. He was into women and drugs. A lot of uh, bad things went down, and it culminated in him and his wife being murdered right here in this house. So I am going to tell you quite a bit more about this story. There's people living here now. I really don't want to intrude on their privacy. But it all happened right here. That window right there. And there's a fireplace right next to it. She was on the sofa right there. And I'll show you the picture. Hope you enjoy this video, my friends. It's, uh, it is on the uh, violent side, I understand. But sometimes that's what happens in Big Bill Anderson's death tours. We go to that side. It's not always fun and games. So stay tuned, my friends. I'll tell you the whole story. Gustav Gus Greenbaum was born in Chicago to Jewish immigrant parents. After his family moved to New York, Gus became an associate of mobster Meyer Lansky. Greenbaum joined his organization on New York's Lower East Side in the mid or late 1910s. After moving back to Chicago, Gus became an associate of the Outfit. The Outfit sent Greenbaum west to Phoenix, Arizona in 1928 to manage the Southwest Division of its wire service, Transamerican. In the late 1940s, he was moved to Las Vegas where he took over the Flamingo Hotel after Bugsy Siegel was murdered and put the place in the black within the first six months of its management. By 1950, Greenbaum was widely recognized as the driving force behind the success of the $50 million Tropicana, as well as being known and respected in the underworld as a reliable source of information on Las Vegas real estate. Greenbaum was living in Phoenix, Arizona, part-time with his wife, Bess, in this beautiful home that you see in front of you, on a nice quiet street next to Encanto Park. After his phenomenal success at the Flamingo and the Tropicana, Greenbaum was called 
in to put the Riviera Casino in the black after the place lost $5 million from its original investors. Greenbaum didn't want the job, but Tony Arcardo and Jake Cusick, the Chicago mob's money manager and technically Greenbaum's boss, personally flew out to Phoenix to try to persuade him to take the position at the Riviera. Greenbaum heard them out but turned the job down. Because he told them that the strain of correcting the outfit's stupid mistakes was starting to take its effects on him. After seven years on the hot seat, he had had enough. He was tired, he was rich, and he wanted to retire away from Las Vegas to this home here in Phoenix. Accardo and Cusick said they understood and returned to Chicago. A week later, Greenbaum's sister-in-law, Leonie Greenbaum, was found murdered in her Phoenix home. It was determined that she was smothered by someone placing their hand over her nose and mouth. Her husband, Charles, Gus's brother, found her in their bedroom. There was no robbery. The message was received. Greenbaum moved back to Vegas to run the Riviera for a 27% interest in the place. This time he lasted only three years. In 1958, Johnny Roselli, who was close to Greenbaum, was told by Paul Rica and Arcardo to order Greenbaum to step down. He was addicted to heroin, drunk when he wasn't high, running around with women half his age who stole from him, and deeply in debt from his gambling at the tables, losing up to $20,000 a week. Worst of all, he was skimming from the joint. Beyond, said Johnny Roselli, what Sam Giancana and the guys back in Chicago considered reasonable. Roselli went out to Vegas and gave Greenbaum the order. He was to sell his share in the Riviera to one of the outfit's front men and leave town. Do that and he could live, all past transgressions forgiven. But Greenbaum refused. This town is in my blood, Johnny, he told Roselli, and went back to stealing from the skim. Then Marshal Califano, Chicago's enforcer in Vegas, was sent in to handle the problem. It all came to a head on the night of December 2, 1958, here in this house. Bess Greenbaum drove their housemaid, Pearl Ray, home after work, as usual. After dropping off Pearl, Bess headed back to this residence at 1115 West Monte Vista Road. The round trip to Pearl's place on 15th Avenue in Bess's white 1957 Cadillac was only about four miles, perhaps 12 minutes of driving time. Just who one or more assailants entered the Green Bomb home after uh, Bess returned that night remains a mystery to this day. It was also theorized that the assailants had followed Bess into the garage as she was pulling her car in. The viciousness of the beating and knifing deaths of Gus Greenbaum, 65, and Bess Greenbaum, 64, had the distinct appearance of a mob hit. Pearl suffered from shock after discovering Bess's body the next day. Following treatment in a hospital, she provided her story to reporters. Pearl says that she returned to work at the Greenbaum shortly before noon the next day. December 3rd, using her key to get in. While in the kitchen, she noticed that oddly some frozen food she removed the night before remained on the counter. That's when I opened the door to the den and saw Bess on the couch, Pearl said, and I just ran out of there and went to the neighbors. The front window to the far right of the house is the living room where Bess was found. Behind the tall vines, behind the lawn chairs here, in the front of the house, this is where the sofa was that Bess was found on. The corner window above Bess's head in the photo that I'm going to provide is the same window by the vined fireplace. Bess's lifeless body lay face down on a sofa. She was fully dressed, shoes and all, her wrists bound behind her by a necktie, at first thought to have been one of Gus's ties, but police considered it a cheap one 
with the label removed and not likely to be of Greenbaum's taste. A severe blow from a blunt object, police survived surmised a heavy decorative glass bottle found beside Bess's head fractured her skull. Pillows were on the side of her head, perhaps to stifle her cries. A wound from her neck bled into the section of a newspaper, a towel and a pillow carefully placed under her by the killer to keep blood from dripping onto the carpet. The attacker the attacker used a razor-sharp 9-inch butcher knife from a match set in the drawer in the Greenbaum's kitchen to slit her throat, probably after hitting her on the head. The knife sat inside a cellophane bag over her feet. The killer employed the bag as a glove to avoid leaving fingerprints on the knife. The bag can clearly be seen in the photos that the reporters and police took. Pearl did not know what happened to Gus the night before. When police arrived December 3rd, inside the bedroom, 50 feet from where Bess lay, they found his body laying across the couple's twin beds that were pushed together. The television, Greenbaum's heating pad, and a table lamp were all on. As with Bess, two pillows lay on either side of his head as to muffle his screams. Two hard blows to the rear of his skull, each produced fractures. Someone slashed his throat with the same knife used on Bess, nearly decapitating him. He was still dressed in his beige silk pajamas. Police later found out that 2000 in cash was missing, as was a three-carat diamond ring valued at 3000 removed from Gus's hand. His pricey wristwatch remained on the nightstand. Bess's purse contained $110 in cash, Furs and other jewelry valued at more than $6,000 were not taken. Photos of Bess Greenbaum's body were widely publicized in newspapers. The New York Daily News ran it on the front page on December 4th, as did the Arizona Republic newspaper. Speculation by police about the motive for the slayings immediately centered on mob vengeance. Investigation. Investigators found no evidence of forced entry. Cigarette ashes and footprints by the garage led police to believe that two men lay in wait for Bess to leave with Pearl. The two women may have left the side door unlocked next to the garage. The killers then entered without breaking in and murdered Gus. When Bess quickly returned, they hit her over the head, bound her hands, then perhaps when she came to, slashed her throat to eliminate her as a witness. A few days later, police in Phoenix announced that officers had recovered some fingerprints from the crime scene. We are checking them out. We don't have any other leads, said police captain Orm Moorhead. We have much talking and much footwork to do. In May of 1959, Moorhead returned to Phoenix from a trip to confer with the police in Las Vegas, but said there were no likely suspects. Ben Goffstein, Greenbaum's partner at the Riviera Hotel in Las Vegas, offered a $10,000 reward for any tip leading to an arrest and f conviction. There were no takers. The Chicago outfit, which by mob standards anyway, normally showed a loyalty to those who served it, would have let Greenbaum's sins go. After all, he had made them a fortune, but Meyer Lansky had a piece of the Riviera and pushed for Greenbaum's demise. That was Meyer's contract, Johnny Roselli said years later. Gus Greenbaum's name was merged with Mo Sedways to inspire the name for the character Mo Green in the American crime drama film, The Godfather, in 1972. Now, my friends, we're going to leave this spot, and I'm going to take you a few miles away and show you the cemetery where Gus and Bess Greenbaum are laid to rest. Follow me, my friends. Okay, my friends, we are back. We are at Beth Israel Memorial Cemetery in Phoenix for the final resting place for Gus and Bess Greenbaum. And Gus was skimming money from the mob. 
at the Riviera Hotel in Las Vegas. He didn't learn his lesson from three years before when the mob killed his sister-in-law, Leone, in 1955, married to his brother, Charles, who is laid to rest right here. Charles Greenbaum came home from work one day and found his wife murdered on their living room floor. She had been smothered. And that was after Gus had refused to do some things for the mob that he was asked to do in Vegas. He refused. And uh, he was trying his best to retire quietly in Phoenix, going back and forth to Vegas, of course, still trying to run the Riviera Hotel. But the problem is money and greed, women and drugs. All of that was Gus's downfall because the mob got tired of it. And on December 2nd, 1958, Gus and Bess were murdered in their beautiful home that I took you to earlier in this video. And it's a very sad situation, of course, but when you put your hands, uh, wash your hands with the mob, uh, this is what can happen, death. So. Big Bill Anderson's Death Tours saying, I hope you enjoyed the video. Please like, subscribe, ring the notification bell. Thank you to my many new subscribers. Greatly appreciated. Greatly. And thank you so much, my friends. Have a beautiful day. Big Bill Anderson saying adios.